wasn't it a beautiful, beautiful 2021? How many of you enjoyed 2021? Better than 2020? 2020 was always at home, mostly at home, but 2020 we could get out and do something, right? Awesome, great. So let's quickly dive into today's word and what the Lord has for each one of us. And the title of today's sermon is, uh, We Need to Move. From the verse, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 13 verses 5 to 6. Hebrews chapter 13 verses 5 to 6. And it says like this, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Amen. What can man do to me? I want you to take this promise in your heart. Put your hand on your chest and say, God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Now, <clears throat> I want you to do a small thing. Hold a person's hand beside you. Somebody's hand. Hold them. Hold it. And I want you to hold it tight. Hold it tight. Murukki pedike. Do you feel the tightness? That's how God says, I will not leave you nor forsake you. When you feel lonely, what do you do? Feel that tightness. God said what? What did God say? This is the words of God himself. He said, what he said? I won't leave you. Come on, tell your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, I might leave you, but God will not leave you. <laughs> Amen. You can let go. Let the blood circulation continue. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. See, this is the Lord telling you, at the end of 2021, the Lord is telling you, I am not going to leave you. I will not leave you. Get it in your head. I am not going to leave you. I'm, because God is there with me and is not going to leave me, I am not going to be afraid. So this is God's promise telling you today. I am not going to leave you. Do you know when, Jesus, when God said this, there are three portions of the scripture when God confirmed this promise to each one of us. The first one, we're going to go through this three scriptures, three uh, events or times when Jesus or God said this. First one is in Genesis chapter 28 verse 15. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 28 where the first time where God said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Genesis chapter 28 verse 15. It says, Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go and I'll bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. This is the first time God said, and God it records in the scripture that I will not leave you nor forsake you. The first time. This is Jacob in the wilderness journey. That I will not leave you nor forsake you. Now, you know the story about this? This is a story when Jacob um, comes or, or Jacob is asked to go to get a wife. And he is on a journey to, to, uh, to his uh, uncle's home, home where he is supposed to select a wife for himself. And that is from the scriptures we see from the whole of Genesis 28, we see that this journey that he takes, the journey that uh, uh, Jacob takes to find a wife. That is where he says. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 28, verses 1 to 5. Genesis chapter 28, verses 1 to 5. It says like this, Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him, You must not take a wife, for from the Canaanite woman. Arise and go to Padan, Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So Jacob is telling him now, go to your uncle's place, that is your mother's brother's place, and go and take one, <coughs> one of your uncle's daughters as your wife. And verse 3 says, God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of people. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your uh, sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram, 
to Laban, the son of Bethuel, and uh, the Armenian, uh, Aramian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau's mother. So this is where Jacob is commissioning, uh, Isaac is commissioning Jacob, go get a wife. Now, have you ever imagined, why did Jacob tell to go and get a wife from another place? Why did Jacob do that? It could be, it could be that Esau's wife was not good. Esau was married by then. Maybe, you know, one daughter-in-law doesn't, good, doesn't cook good food. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but most important is, we see in the scriptures in many places that when a man marries a wife, a lot of times, when they marry the wife, they marry a lot of things along with the wife, along with the gods the wives used to worship. So this intermingling was not something encouraged. So in order to avoid that, Jacob said, uh, Isaac said to Jacob, go, get, go to your uncle's place and get a wife for you. See, the whole plan of God was to bring redemption into this world through this family of Abraham. From Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and then is going down. So the redemption of the world is coming through this family. So if that has to happen, they should not get mixed up with gods from the other neighboring place. So Isaac tells Jacob, go get somebody from there. <clears throat> Let's move on to Genesis 28, verses 6 to 9. Genesis 28, 6 to 9. This is what happens. Now Esau, when that Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take a wife from there, and that he blessed him, directed him, you must take a wife you must not take a wife from the Canaanite woman. Okay? Then verse 7. And Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and gone to Paddan Haram. So look at this. What did Jacob do? Jacob obeyed his father's instruction. This is very important. Jacob obeyed. Everybody say, Jacob obeyed. Did Esau obey? So probably Jacob, uh, Isaac would have told to Esau also. We don't know. But Isaac was a little... Rowdy guy, right? Rowdy kind of guy he was. But he looks like he didn't obey. Look, look down. Verse uh, 8. So Esau saw that the Canaanite woman did not please Isaac, his father. Look at that. So the one daughter-in-law, Isaac, is not happy. We don't know why. We don't know why Isaac was not happy with his daughter-in-law. Like I said, maybe the food she cooked was bad. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe, maybe she brought in a culture which he couldn't go along with. And that probably is the reason. Probably she brought in their gods into the family of Isaac. Probably that is the main because we see that in the scriptures many places Solomon took many wives and along with them came their gods. Many people we see in the scripture that Ahab, Ahab took Jezebel, Jezebel from, from another place and they brought, she brought in her gods. So in the scripture we see again and again recorded that if you take a person from another culture you not only bring the girl, you bring in their culture also in it. So God says, so Isaac tells his son Jacob, don't take wife from here. Go to your uncle's place and get. And look at verse, verse 9. Uh, now I, Esau, is, Esau realizes that his wife, his first wife, uh, Isaac is not happy with. Okay, so what does he do? As a revenge he does, Esau went to, Esau went to Ismail and took as his wife, besides the wives he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ismail, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabaoth. Look at that. Now, this guy is now on a challenge. Aha. Or if, if, if my father doesn't like this girl, I will bring from the stepbrother of my father. Who is Isaac's stepbrother? Ismail. I will bring his daughter. And he goes, marries a girl from that. See, look at that. When Isaac, Isaac's wish, a father's wish is like this, he goes totally against his father's wish. So children, I want to encourage you all today. Listen to your parents. It's very important. If you want the blessings to flow down onto your life, listen to your parents. All right? Now Jacob is on this, on this journey to select a wife because Esau's wives are not good enough. Remember, your wife... Your partner is important for the next generation. It's very, very important. Guys, remember. Girls, remember. 
whom you marry, whom you'll get along with, very important for the next generation. God's promises is on the union between you two. So select persons wisely. All right? So he goes on this journey. So now Jacob is on this journey go to go. Now this journey is a very, have you ever imagined, you're going to a place far away in a, in a wilderness. You probably don't know this uncle of yours. You've never seen this uncle. You only heard about your mother's uncle. You've never seen this uncle. Those days there was no WhatsApp. There was no internet. There was no video chat. Nothing. You don't know how the uncle looks even. You only know that you go in a certain direction in the wilderness, you will reach there. And this is uncle's name. Go tell him you are so-and-so's son or daughter. So this happens on the journey. And he is going all by himself. He's going all by himself. Have you ever traveled alone? And have you ever traveled lonely? To go to a place where you don't know where it is and how it is. You don't know who this uncle is. And what is your aim? To find a wife. And, 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 Jake, and Isaac says, go find a wife from your uncle. I mean, who's getting married? The father or the son? If I was in Jacob's place, I'm getting married. Why can't I choose somebody from here? Why should I go thousands of hundreds of miles in the desert, walking night and day? For what? To find a wife. Where are you going to deal? Nobody else. Can't you find somebody else nearby? But the key is Jacob obeyed. But Esau didn't obey. And you see later the blessings of God coming into Jacob's life. So Jacob starts on this journey. A lonely journey. He's alone. Traveling alone. In the wilderness. To find a bride. And that is where it comes in, in the scriptures where we read in Genesis 28, verse 12 and 50, where he comes to in the evening one day, and one, one of the first evening he comes, he says, I want to rest because it's night. He takes a stone as a pillow, and he goes to sleep, and then he sees a dream. And we pick up from that in Genesis chapter 28, verse 12 to 15. And he dreamt, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to the heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offsprings shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. This is a promise now Jacob gets personally from God directly in a dream. That when he's sleeping here, in the lonely wilderness, in the loneliest of times, he says, God comes to you and says, I will not leave you nor forsake. Come on, tell to your neighbor, God is not going to leave you nor forsake you. Until he's accomplished, what are you supposed to do? And what was Jacob's accomplishment here? What is Jacob's accomplishment here? To find a wife. To win a heart. To find a wife, to win a heart. Crossing the wilderness to win a heart. Wow, that is an extreme journey. You cross the desert wilderness, dry wilderness. You know how the deserts are. Imagine walking away from the promised land all to Iraq. His uncle is in Iraq. And this, he is now in Canaan, somewhere near the Jordan side. Walking all the way from there to, to Iraq, where his uncles were. That is a long journey, all alone. To find what? To find a wife. To find a wife, and probably in his imagination is, my mother is like this, so probably I'll get somebody like this. That culture, that nature, that likings, that taste. That is probably in his mind. You're walking and you're walking and you're walking in the desert, in the wilderness, all by yourself. What am I doing? I'm going. Where are you going? To my uncle to find a wife. This is strange. It is strange. But I want to tell you one thing. That today, <clears throat> the Lord is trying to tell you. One of you, some of you here, are the Lord is taking you on a journey. 
2022, the Lord is going to take you on a journey to win somebody's heart. I'm not telling you you're going to win somebody to marry them. No. What I'm telling you is you are going to win somebody's heart. And you have to win somebody's heart this 2022. Like our senior pastors were telling, there is something we need to do. The world is dying around us. Enough listening to all the sermons. Jacob also today sent a, uh, sent a uh, message. He said, 2022, the year of action. I like that. Year of action. It is enough that you listen to it. Now go. We need to move. Come on, tell your neighbor. We need to move. We have to win somebody's heart. Amen? Jacob was commissioned to go through the wilderness to win a heart for a bride. You are commissioned today to win another heart for Jesus. That is our role. 2022, we need to bring at least one soul to the Lord. That is the senior pastor's commission. At least one soul we need to bring in 2022, if not more. That should be our aim. It is a lonely journey, I'm telling you. It is a lonely journey. And along the way, in the desert, there are snakes, there are wild beasts, there is dry times, sandstorm times, rain time, all issues will come. <clears throat> but we have to go. We have to move. You need to win a heart. Our aim this year is to win a heart. That's what we need to do. And that is where God comes and says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. A lonely journey. <clears throat> do you know that a uh, designer called C. Chan, C. Chan, can, C. Chan, whatever, designer, in uh, early in 2012, he designed a special kind of jacket. This is a picture that you can see of a special kind of jacket. This is a like a green, a bright green bomber jacket that you can wear. And the speciality of this bomber jacket is he designed it in such a way that it's got hands clasped in front. Five of them in the front. Clasped. You ask people, the reporters ask designer, why did you design a jacket with all these hands like this? There's hands on the top. I mean, of course, this guy is the model is covering his eyes, but he bring it down. The hands on the chest. And he designed a lot of jackets like this during the time with hands. We asked him, why did you design with hands? He said, the world is very lonely. Shouldn't we have a hug from somebody? So his main concept of designing this jacket is, these hands are like somebody's hugging you. We all need a hug, isn't it? We all need a hug. This world is lonely. It's a wilderness journey that we're going through. We need a hug from somebody. We need to give a hug to somebody. We need to win somebody's heart. Maybe it's just a hug that you give that can win somebody. Maybe it's a smile that you give. Maybe it's a listening ear that you give to somebody that you can win their heart. <clears throat> but my challenge, what the Holy Spirit wants to tell you today is, we need to win a heart. We are on a journey. We need to win a heart. The second time God says, I will not leave you nor forsake you, we find it in Joshua chapter 1, verses 2 and 5. The first time was in Genesis. Now we see in Joshua, Deuteronomy and Joshua, the same instance recorded in Deuteronomy. And we'll go to Joshua chapter 1, verses 2 and 5. And they are about to enter the promised land. Joshua 1, 2 and 5. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over to Jordan, you and all these people, into the land that I'm giving, you, giving them to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I will give to you, just as I have promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with you, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Come on, tell your neighbor, God is not going to leave you nor forsake you. This is the second time God is telling directly. <coughs> God is telling directly to Joshua, I will not leave you nor forsake you. I have commissioned you for a purpose. I am going, to, you are commissioned to cross a river and to claim the promised land. Commissioned to cross a river to claim a promised land. To cleanse the land, in other way. Joshua's aim is what? To cleanse the land. Means the land which was promised to them was filled with Hittites and all the Canaanites and all the otherites. Termites and bug buds and all the time. You know, everybody was, it was polluted with that. His aim is to 
conquer and cleanse and keep it neat. Get it back to them. That was his commission. And God said to him directly, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Come on. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Can we, why is it, why did, why, did Josh, why did God have to come to Joshua? See, I can understand Jacob's time. He was lonely. He was alone. Right? All by himself in the wilderness. He has never seen his uncle. He's going to a place where a person so called so, you don't know if that person is alive also. And you don't know what kind of a girl you're going to find. That journey with Jacob had. Lonely journey. But Joshua had all these people, right? You might be thinking, why did God come to Joshua and tell him, I will not leave you nor forsake you? Do you know why? Because in spite of the fact that there were a million of people around him, actually, Joshua didn't have any friends. You know why? Only one guy was there his age. Who was that? Caleb. Amen. Only one guy was alive. All the other people his age and his time, they're all dead and gone in the wilderness. He was like the only guy remaining, last man standing. He and Caleb standing to enter the promised land. And he's got this huge responsibility to go, to take this million number of people across the river into the promised land. And the promised land is not easy. The river is not easy, first of all, to cross it. There is turbulence and tides and currents and waves are there. Some places it flushes out, but we need to cross that river. The Holy Spirit wants to tell you today that I have brought you thus far. I have brought you from the wilderness. Now, you need to cross and conquer. Cross and conquer. Come on, tell your neighbor. Cross and conquer. That's what we need to do. That is our aim this 2022. We need to cross and conquer not just the land. We need to cross and conquer somebody's heart. Cross and conquer somebody's heart. There's a, there is a promised land there waiting. We need to capture it. These lands of other people's hearts are corrupted. But we need to get that corruption out and we need to cleanse it. That's our aim. And then when you go with that commission, it says... I will not leave you nor forsake you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Just till until this time when God says this, maybe a few days before that, Moses was still there. Moses, the great man who took all these people, started, started uh, the Exodus when he was 80 years of age, brought all these people to the promised land. Now Moses is dead. The, 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 the responsibility that is on Joshua's shoulder. You can't imagine that. It's, it's really tough. 40 years before, he had 12, he had 10 other people with him who went to spy the land. In their age group, they're all sent together 40 years ago. Now Joshua is probably 80 or something. And the full weight of his shoulder of leading these people to conquer a land with all these Hittites, Canaanites, is upon him. It is tough. The water is tough to cross. But the promise today the Holy Spirit is telling you is, go. We have to go. We have to cross. We have to conquer. We have to cross and conquer the hearts of people. Yes, we need to go. That's the promise what God said to Abraham. I will not leave you nor forsake you. You just go. I'm there with you. All you have to do is go. I mean, Joshua could have said, I'm 80. <clears throat> I don't need to go. Just I'm gray hair. Old. Caleb had strength. He said, I want to go and fight. Joshua doesn't have that strength. It doesn't record that. But he, he could have very well backed out. God, you select somebody else, young. But God says today, no. Go, conquer. You need to go. All you have to do is go. God is there with you. Amen? Any life situations which is threatening for you, where, where you find a big giant, where you know, you know this place is full of giants, you know it's going to be a long ride. You had the faith 40 years ago. Even though we look like grasshoppers, our God is more powerful than them. That's what you said 40 years ago. He said that. Now, Joshua somehow is getting scared. So God had to come and say, I am not going to leave you nor forsake you. I am still there. 40 years have passed. But Joshua is getting this promise from God. He's saying, I am not going to leave you nor forsake you. It is now your responsibility to go and conquer this land. Amen? 
That is our challenge. The Holy Spirit is telling you, rise and go. I need to, we need to go and promise this land. Get, get, promise this land. <clears throat> get hold of this land. You know, when the weight of the shoulder, of res- on the, sh- the, sh- the responsibility is fit on shoulder, it's so heavy sometimes. It can really depress you sometimes. Do you know that uh, anybody here carrying any load of weight? Anybody here carrying load of weight? Anybody carrying any burden on your head? Luggage, anything? I don't see anything. Anybody carrying? Nobody, right? But actually, the fact is, scientifically it says, science says, that you are carrying a car on your head. You are carrying the load of nearly one ton Newton, one ton kilogram on your head. Because of the gravitational pull, which is upon you. You're supposed to be collapsing. They say the, 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 the force upon you to be crushed to the earth is about one ton, which is approximately the weight of a car. A Toyota Corolla or a, uh, or a Lancer, they all weigh like 800, 900 kilos. That is the amount of weight that is upon you because of the gravitational pull. You should be collapsing and, com- and, and, and dying in this weight. But the fact that you're still standing there because there is an atmospheric pressure that is countering it that can help you make you stand. And that shows only 70 kilos or 60 kilos or 90 kilos on the weighing balance. But actually, the load is much more, much more than that. So unknowingly, without you knowing, you are carrying a heavy burden, burden upon you, a heavy weight upon you. But you don't realize it because there is a force countering against it to keep you standing. Otherwise, you'll all be crushed on the floor. That's how God created. In the same way, let me tell you, the, the situations, the burdens, the situation of your life can crush you down so much, can weigh upon you and push you down really heavy. But the Holy Spirit is ten, telling you here, 2022, I am not going to let you go. I'm going to be with you. I will not forsake you. I am there with you. You have to go. You have to cross this river. Some of you are at the edge, starting a wilderness journey. Some of you are at the edge of a river to cross the promised land. Don't get scared. Don't pull back. Go. Amen? Are you ready to go? Yes. So we need to go to cleanse another person's the land or cleanse the heart of this, of, to, so that God will, that we can give God to them, each one of, our, each one of them. The third time, the verse is recorded is in Solomon's time. And this is not a, 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 a time when God, God doesn't directly speak to him, but David is telling him about God's nature and this character of God. Solomon, a mountain of work to build a house. A mountain of work was given to Solomon to build a house. Let's go to First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 5 to 6. First Chronicles 28, 5 to 6. And all of my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, He has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. He said to me, it is Solomon, your son, who shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. So David has assembled all Israel, all the nations, all the elders together. In front of them, he's announcing that my son is going to be my heir, the heir to the next to the throne. He's going to take the throne. Among all the sons, God selected Solomon. And this is what David is announcing to them. And we see in 9 verses 9 to 10, 1 Chronicles 9 to 10. This is what now um, David is telling Solomon. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God your father. Know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Be careful now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Be strong and do it. So, so David, is being com- David is commissioning his son Solomon to take the throne. But along with the fact that he is going to be the next king, he also has to build the temple of God which David wanted to build so much in his heart. He got all the materials ready, but God said, you cannot build. Your hand has got blood, so you cannot build. Your son will build it. 
So the whole of 1 Chronicles 28, if you read, David tells to Solomon, you know what? The table should be like this. The menorah should be like this. The curtain should be like this. The wall should be like this. The door should be like this. This much gold you have to use here. That much gold you have to use there. You must hang pomegranates and grapes and all that stuff. These are all decorations you do. And David is explaining all the decorations you need for this temple on, in chapter 28. And then he says, uh, uh, then he says, come down to verse, uh, what are we, 1 Chronicles 20, 28, 20. 1 Chronicles 28, 20. Then David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until all the works of the service of the house of the Lord is finished. Look at that. God's promise. David is telling about God's promise. That is, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, God is not going to leave you nor forsake you. Amen? God is not going to leave you nor forsake you. <coughs> David was not an architect. and It is not easy to build a house, let alone to build a house of God. And now Solomon has got this responsibility to build. There is no 3D visualizing factor. There are no drawings to build. David just tell, it should be like this, like this, like this, like this. Huh. And Solomon is like, yes, get it done. But the amount of work you have to do to get this done, the promise, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Don't worry about it. I will not leave you nor forsake you. This amount of work that has that is fallen upon Solomon at that time, this mountain of work to be done, it's overwhelming. And that's when David tells to Solomon, Solomon, don't give up. You have to get it done. Because your God is not going to leave you nor forsake you. It's another mountain. You know, when you climb a mountain, when you, when you climb one mountain of work that you're given, sometimes, you know, when you're in your workplace, you know how it is like? The workload climbs up. Pending works. Have you gone through that situation? Pending work just climb up. Many, many people hate going back to work after holidays. You know why? Because after holidays, the first thing you have to do is you'll find is a lot of work piling on top of you. When you go for vacation and come back, the people who were asked to follow up will never do anything and all piled up. Am I right? Anybody in the house feel that way? Yes. Amen. Yes. So you hate going back to work after a vacation or after a holiday because you know this pile of work will be there waiting for you. Everybody, like some people are excited coming back to work, but you are sad going to work because of this responsibility you have when you get back to work. But when you have this kind of work to do, God is trying to tell you, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Get it done. Get it done. It's a mountain of work. Uh, when you finish this one mountain of work, what will happen? Another mountain will come up here. <laughs> Am I right? Yes. Every day is a mountain climb. Am I right? Every day our work is like a mountain climb. But we have to climb the mountain. Only when you reach the top of the mountain, you will see the top of the next mountain. If you don't see the next mountain, which means you're still down. Which means you haven't climbed the mountain yet. So this is what Solomon is given a responsibility, a task, a huge mountain of work to do to complete this task. And God says, I will not leave you nor forsake you. We need to cross the mountain. We need to climb and cross the mountain. Amen? For some of you, the Holy Spirit is telling you, there is a mountain of work on the other side. But don't worry. I'm there with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Amen? Hallelujah. I will not leave you nor forsake you. <clears throat> Once a psychologist came to a person when he was talking and gave this, can I share this bottle of water? Okay. He came and asked this question. How much weight is there in this bottle of water? How much weight is there? Guess. Anybody guess? I'm having a 250 millimeter of water. How much weight is there? How much weight? Guess. Half kilo? Or quarter kilo, 200 grams, 300 grams, okay? Let's say half kilo. This, the person said, the psychologist said, this depends on, how, the weight of this depends, not on what it is, the weight of this depends on how long you're going to hold it. He said, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm holding this bottle of water, 
in my hand for five minutes with my hand stretched out, how much is the weight? It's one certain amount of newtons. But if I'm going to hold it for one hour, how much is that weight? It's more painful. It'll hurt my hand. If I'm supposed to hold it for more than two, three hours, what's going to happen to my hand? It's going to get a cramp. It's going to hurt. So the weight of this depends on how long you're going to hold on to this. Sometimes, you know, this big mountain of problem that we have, it's because we're still holding on to it. We need to let it go. We have these mountains we need to cross. That's why it says in Psalms 118, verse 5 and 7. Psalms 118, verse 5 and says, Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side. As my helper, I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Amen. That's the promise we have. The triumph we have. I'm not going to be afraid of any man because the Lord is on my side. Come on, tell your neighbor. The Lord is not going to leave me nor forsake me. <clears throat> Three journeys that we saw today. Three journeys we saw. Jacob's journey through the wilderness to win a heart. Joshua's journey to cross a river to cleanse a land or a cleanse a heart. Solomon's journey to cross a mountain, to climb a mountain, to build a house. This is what the Holy Spirit is telling you. Don't give up. Don't let go. There is a lonely heart you need to win. There is a promised heart you need to conquer. There is an anointed temple that you need to build. I will read that again for you. There is a lonely heart in 2022 that you need to win. There is a promised heart that you need to conquer. And there is an anointed temple that you need to build. 2022, your commission for 2022 is Win, cleanse, and build. Win a heart, cleanse a heart, let that heart be the temple of God. Because God lives in the temple. God lives in a heart. That's our commission for this year 2020. Amen? I'm not going to leave. What is the meaning of leaving, forsaking you? You know what's the meaning of leaving? Leaving is let loose. Do you know what? When you have these pets, you have a leash that you hold on to a dog and you take the dog for a walk. Have you taken dogs out for walks? Maybe not here, but you have seen people carrying a leash in the hand. That leash is always tied to the collar of the dog. So it is never, you never let it go. That is how the word it says, I will not forsake, I will not leave you. I will not leave you. It will not never let it go. It's not that God is holding you on a leash. The fact is that God is holding on to you. He will never let you go. I will not leave you nor forsake you. The meaning of forsaking is to let go of something after a point of time. To let go of something after a point of time. To abandon something or someone. To separate something or someone after a particular time. People might leave you and abandon you. But my God will never leave you nor abandon you. Amen? Are you ready for it? Are you ready to take this challenge to the next year, 2022? We have to move. We need to move. We need to move. We need to cross the wilderness. We need to cross the river. We need to climb a mountain. We need to do that. There is a desert to walk. There is a river to cross. And there is a mountain to conquer. That is our promise for 22. Amen? In all this, what is God telling you? I will not leave you nor forsake you. Amen?